Okay. So I'm going to start. Hi, everybody. Yes, I'm coming to you on behalf of Jim and Ross, my co-presenters from almost the southernmost tip of Africa. And uh, lots to say, very little time, so I'm going to jump right into it. Today, I'm going to discuss the use of conservation detection dogs in a mark recapture program for the geometric tortoise in the Western Cape. The outline of my presentation, I'm going to briefly introduce the geometric tortoise, discuss its major threats, conservation challenges, and illustrate this with a case study. I'll introduce our mark recapture program, uh, briefly describe the study area methodology, discuss the preliminary results, and then just touch on a few added bonuses we found with the program, and close with acknowledgements. So the geometric tortoise is commonly known as the Fabergé egg of the Shalonian world. Uh, its conservation status has gone from vulnerable to endangered, and in 2015, it's classified as critically endangered. It's also been included in the 100 most threatened animals, plants, and fungi by members of the uh, species, IUCN Species Survival Commission. I've lumped the three major threat categories into habitat loss, fragmentation, and by alteration. By alteration, I mean a change in perhaps the grazing techniques or also uh, the spread of invasive alien plant vegetation into the habitat. Then uh, the second I'm uh, threat is unplanned and frequent fires. So the geometric tortoise does occur in a feinbos vegetation type, which is a fire, occurs in a fire-driven ecosystem. However, recently our fires have become much larger in extent and more frequent, mainly due to anthropomorphic reasons. And uh, we don't have the, because of uh, habitat fragmentation, we haven't got the surrounding population of unburnt natural felt with geometrics that can then repopulate the burnt areas and um, uh, yeah, uh, account for the mortality. And then lastly, something that's come on the radar recently in the past five years is climate change. It's happening at a rapid rate. Uh, we're seeing the results on the ground and we're just wondering if the geometric tortoise can adapt to the pace at which um, the climate is in changing and the effect it's having on the vegetation. So the conservation challenges, despite its visually prominent and contrasting patterning, the cryptic coloration of the geometric tortoise actually makes it very well camouflaged and difficult to find. It's one of the most sedentary tortoises, so your chances of finding it out in the open, walking around all times of the day are very slim. Also, humans only use one sense to find tortoises, so that's a visual sense and uh, they experience bias in terms of location, size, and search consistency. So just an example of this, in my top um, right-hand corner, you'll see a picture of a stand of eucalyptus trees, which are invasive alien vegetation in South Africa, and a dog hidden right in the middle. This occurred during a search and rescue uh, that we were doing. We would never have searched the area because we just assumed that the dogs, I mean, the geometrics occur in Feinbos, natural vegetation and uh, very short shrubby vegetation. And the dog pulled us into this area and found geometrics eking out a survival here. And we were fortunately able to remove them and save them and put them in the um, protected area of the reserve. Uh, at the bottom, uh, yes, I know it's not a geometric hatchling. It's a common part of a hatchling that uh, they co-occur with the geometrics, but just to give you an idea of the size, range that we find um, and that the dog finds. And uh, for the dog uh, using a, a scent, it's not about the size, the bigger the size, the more uh, scent the, uh, the tortoise produces. We found that with, with hatchlings, they actually uh, move a lot in a very small area and create quite a concentrated search um, scent for the dog or search pad almost for the dog to pick up on fairly easily, as opposed to a larger adult that is not moving around for a long period of time, is holed up in a bush and with very little air movement will be more difficult for the dog to find even though it's larger in size. Um, the other thing, we don't have the luxury anymore of being able to have 20, teams of 20 to 30 people for three, four days a week at a time out in the field combing every single bush to see if there's a geometric underneath it. It's just not possible anymore with the constraints we have. Um, and we've seen the results. We miss a lot of tortoises with that. Also, we don't have the same searches every day in each team. It's different people all the time. So we have no consistency in terms of skills um, or um, in terms of surveyors. The closest we've come to doing a comparison between the two search techniques 
um, occurred when we had a development site with six hectares uh, split in two by a road and the developers put a tortoise proof fence around it and the human team came in and searched the area and removed what they thought was almost 99% of the tortoises, that was 28. They were removed from the area. I was then asked to come in with the dogs and do a final sweep to pick up any one or two that may have been left behind. Um, as you can see at the end of the day, um, the result was that the, tort the human team had one tortoise per 6.4 hour search time and 0.7 tortoises per searcher. And then for the dog team, it was one tortoise per one hour search time and 12 tortoises per searcher. So as you can see, the biggest difference occurred in the cost per unit effort per hectare. The human team in blue cost considerably more than the dog team in red. And then in terms of number of tortoises found per searcher, the dog team in red um, did a very lot better than the human team in blue. Obviously this was not um, an exact comparison because there weren't the same amount of targets for each team to find, um, but it's as close as we have got to comparing the two to date. So the mark recapture program. In 2015, the Turtle Conservancy secured ownership of 365 hectares um, of the last stronghold of the geometric tortoise. Uh, Cape Nature and the Turtle Conservancy formed a partnership and initiated mark recapture surveys using conservation detection dogs in order to find out more about the population at the site and to inform conservation management of the species on the ground. So the study area, um, at the moment, it doesn't extend across the whole 365 for this mark recapture study. We've concentrated on two blocks, northern block and a southern block, divided by a highway. The northern block is divided into, further divided into four blocks and the southern side into two. And then what I try and do is two transect loops of two hours dur duration each um, in a for a search. So that's four hours search period per day. Um, and yeah, but they are the, the ultimate goal is to find as many tortoises as possible in the time permitted. We only search in spring and autumn. Um, we don't uh, do any searches in summer because it's detrimental to the tortoises and also um, there's uh, the threat of snakes to the dogs. Um, so yes, this is an example of uh, a real life, what the transect looks like on the ground. It doesn't always go to plan, it's not perfect, but that's just how life is because there are, as I said, abiotic and um, phytic factors that affect it. So the purple track is the dog track, the white track is the human track, and the um, yellow dots, are, the yellow points are the geometric finds and the blue uh, points are the angulate finds. As you can see, um, the dog pulled me right off track to find geometric male number 108. It was out in the open and I suspect that on that day, if there was a breeze blowing from the southeast with the tortoise out moving about in the open, the scent would have been able to be picked up from quite a far way away and the dog just pulled me right there um, to that tortoise, which was off the transect loop, but I have to trust her and listen to her. And at the end of the day, we got the find. So now we come to the part of the presentation that I don't have anything to do with. I'm just the dog lady that finds the tortoises, captures the data and sends it off. Ross Keister is a statistician from the Turtle Conservancy and scientist. Um, and he works out the estimated number of tortoises using the Cormac Jolly Siever method in R recapture. N equals 542, where N is the total number of different individuals that were marked and possibly recaptured according to our recapture. As you can see here, there was a distinct drop between 2017 and 2018. So of those 542 that were marked, we've had 98 that were recaptured once and 11 that were e-recaptured twice or more times. For example, number 2000 was marked and had three recaptures subsequent to that. And number 6000 was marked in 2015 recaptured in 2016 and unfortunately died in 2019. We've also found more males than females. i will discuss that later. I know it doesn't add up to 542, but some records were removed in final analysis. We use the Honiger notch marking system, notch marking with a file or a Dremel tool. And uh, yes, when, they, when there's not a many tortoises at a site, I can work alone. But um, at this site, there are a lot of tortoises and we try and handle them as little as possible and in the shortest amount of time. So what Jim and Ross have been instrumental is helping us train up field rangers. This is Rudy and Winnie. Rudy is a star, he can notch mark. Um, he follows the numbering system 
he takes all the measurements and when he is um, there to record everything and capture it electronically. So in the discussion at this stage, we can say we have a population of roughly 1000 sortuses, but we do need more data for improved accuracy. Yes, we found more males and females, and this um, I attribute to behavioral characteristics, especially in the spring, that's mating season, and I often find more than one male in a certain area, it can be three or almost four um, in a wide radius, which I don't find with the females. So I suspect it's got something to do with their behavioral traits. Um, as I alluded to, there was a definite decline in 2017, and um, we attribute this to the drought and to a fire on the southern side. Um, the drought, we suspect that the tortoises, perhaps we haven't picked up many mortalities um, directly as a result of this, well, yeah, um, in the field, but what I suspect is that they've moved into a much more densely vegetated support area um, to the west of the study area, which is much more sheltered. And I think with the drier conditions, they've moved in there. Um, we did have a fire in the southern side, which is a smaller section, and this did account for mortalities. Um, getting back to climate change, which I uh, raised as one of the recent threats, as you can see in this graph over the past five years, we've had significantly less rainfall compared to the previous 15 years. And this is really a concern for us going forward. And then just to touch on some added bonuses. So unlike um, in Africa, we've got the elephants, the rhinos, the lions, the leopards, the wild dogs. They're all very sexy species and um, people can come out and see them, relate to them. Um, they're cute and furry. And the geometric tortoise just doesn't have the same appeal amongst the public. It's also very difficult to um, garner support and tell people about a uh, species or a little animal that they can't come out and see. We don't reveal the location where these tortoises are found in a very specific area in the Western Cape. Um, we don't um, have volunteers coming out to do our surveys. So it's very difficult for people to know what we're actually talking about. When we started with the dog project, we just put a small article on our website. One media person found it and did an article. And since then, the media awareness has just exploded. We've had many stories written. We've had lovely TV programs done and uh, the combination of the dogs and the geometrics and the story that goes together with it has really been popular. Um, and we've increased uh, people's awareness of it. People are talking about it, especially in the Western Cape. Um, and it's been a real bonus because people understand the importance that small species have. I've also been fortunate in able to show this technique. It's a low tech, non-invasive survey technique in the conservation world to conservation students, you know, both from our Technicon up and coming conservationists in the next generation, um, as well as international students. So this is quite a unique opportunity. I've also been able to share um, with uh, colleagues from or friends from the Durrell Institute in Madagascar. They've come over and seen how we use dogs uh, to find tortoises. And we've also had the opportunity to go over to them um, and explain to them, look at their circumstances and see how they could possibly use dogs. Um, the dogs are not only used in mark recapture programs, as I said, they're very effective in search and rescues, rescues um, both from fire and development, just in terms of being able to respond rapidly um, and being able to go at different times. And uh, yes, we've met some rich and famous and supermodel people along the way, which has been fabulous. In closing, I'd just like to acknowledge Jim Juvik, because without him, the pieces of the puzzle would never have come together. So. Thank you, Jim. Respect and congratulations on winning the Baylor Award. You really deserve it. I'd like to dedicate this presentation to Professor Emeritus uh, Margareta Hofmeyer, who passed away at the beginning of this year. Rita was more than a mentor. She guided and supported us on every step of the journey, and she's going to be sorely missed. So thank you, Rita. That's all I have to say for now. I hope I'm in time. And uh, yes, let me try and open my chat box. And if you can't manage, I can just give you questions here. We're gonna wait just a little bit to see if we have some come in. And uh, after we wait for questions, up next is gonna be Patrick Kane telling us about utilizing do-it-yourself open source technologies to make life easier on the turtle biologist. Um, Vicki, question number one. Um, 
And someone says they missed the first few minutes, so they apologize if you already discussed this, but are there other tortoise species in the area you're working in? Will the dogs only find geometric tortoises or could they adapt to any tortoise study? Oh, that's an excellent question. And I was actually going to include it and then I cut it out of my talk. Um, so I'm so glad you asked that. It's one of the favorite questions and it's something that um, we didn't know before we started the project. So yes, we have uh, um, two other tortoise species that occur with the geometric. So it's the common um, putlipa and then your um, angular tortoise, or we call it the roipens, Jacina. And each of those species actually has a different scent. So if you wanted to, when we do surveys, it's very important for us to know the ratio of geometrics, angulates, and pudlipers in an habitat, because it's very important. I won't go into detail now. So we need to find all those three species. So the dogs are trained to alert on all those three species. However, if you wanted to just train it on geometrics and exclude the other two species, there's, there's enough of a distinction in the smell between the species that you would be able to do that. So Thanks for asking one of my favorite questions and something we didn't know going in um, and something we found out with training. So thank you for asking that. Second question comes from Samrita Padma. Do dogs harm the animals at all? So it's very important with the conservation detection dogs that they have a passive alert. So the dogs don't interact with the target at all. Once they locate the target, um, the dog will either do a sit or a down next to it. So it does not um, pick it up. It doesn't carry it to me. It doesn't scratch the tortoise. And this is a, a very strict rule and it, we enforce it in the training um, because otherwise we wouldn't have be able to work in protected areas if the dogs were had any negative effect on the target. So uh, yeah, we're very strict about that. And we also, that's one of the reasons we don't do surveys in summer is because the, um, the tortoises excrete, you know, when they are disturbed, even if they aren't touched. And um, that loss of liquid, because we haven't, we're in a, a winter rainfall area, is detrimental and they can dehydrate. So we, yeah, we make sure that the tortoises do not harm, um, the dogs do not harm the tortoises in any way. Fascinating. Vicky, one more question. Um, you mentioned biases in human surveys. Are there biases when using dogs to survey? Um, yes, I think um, with the dogs, so if, if the wind is blowing very strongly um, or it's blowing uh, in turbulent the, through the vegetation in turbulent circles, the dog is going to find it very difficult to find the tortoise. So um, we get very strong gale force winds um, and that takes the scent further uh, uh, away from the target much quicker so the dog battles to find to actually pinpoint the target so yes um, there are um, factors that you have to take into consideration and not all conditions are suitable to use dogs in um, I'm trying to think offhand of other biases with dogs um, they do use more than one scent um, yeah, they, they definitely there are conditions that you can't use dogs in. Um, but yeah, apart from that, I must actually go and, and, uh, and think about that a little more. Okay, I've got another one for you. What is the budget generally to train a dog and a handler for this type of research? Um, okay, so it depends on whether the dog is already chained in the game of uh, detection work, because all detection, whether it's your drug detection, explosive detection, starts with the basic principles. So the dog is finding a tortoise, not because it loves tortoises, I think that's an important principle, um, but because it wants a ball reward, uh, that's, that's its paycheck. So if the dog already knows that, um, and it's trained to that level, um, you could probably buy a dog, um, I'm trying to think now uh, in our rents, or oh, you're probably looking at anything between a thousand and ten thousand dollars um, to buy a dog like that and then to have it trained specifically for your type of target. Um, but the dog is also only as good, it's definitely teamwork, so then you've got to have the handler. Um, so the costs vary, it's, it's much easier if you do it in house. Um, and but again, uh, uh, 
yeah, the, the dog and the, the handler dog team is doing four to five times um, the work of a team of 10. So yeah, um, it's difficult to, it's difficult for me to relate uh, costs here from South Africa, but it, and it depends on various factors. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, the initial outlay, oh, that's the other thing. The initial outlay might be expensive, but then for a, a conservation detection dog like this, my dog is going on eight and a half and she's still working. So I've had seven and a half years work out of her for my initial outlay. And it's great. And we have one final one for you um, from someone who joined late. Um, do the dogs have to start training as puppies or can an adult dog be trained to do this as well? Yes, an adult dog can definitely be trained to do it. And with puppies, we definitely don't start with a live target because they're just too interested in playing with it. So it's normally up until a dog is about two years is probably the maximum we'll, we'll take it for an adult dog to train it. Uh, the most important thing is, is the, ball, is the dog interested in a ball and a reward and is it motivated to do it and to use its nose? So yes, adult dogs can definitely be trained for this.